1700 hours universal time, 1900 here in Paris. You're listening to Radio France International. Seamus Kearney. Welcome to this programme of news and features from the French capital. The news headlines this hour. The United States formally recognises Marc Raval Manan as Madagascar's new president. The leaders of the world's richest nations meet in Canada to discuss their relations with the world's poorest countries. The United Nations and a famine warning network is blaming Zimbabwe's policies for hindering the import of grain the country desperately needs to stave off a famine. And in the world news headlines, the US dollar falls against the euro and stock markets take a tumble in the wake of what's being dubbed the Worldcom disaster. Those are the main headlines here on Radio France International. Coming up later in the programme, of course, we have our sports coverage. Brazil beating Turkey 1-0 going through to the final of the World Cup, playing Germany on Sunday. But first to the news, and the United States has formally recognised Marc Raval Manan as Madagascar's new president. Ambassadors from all the major Western donor countries, except France, attended a ceremony today to mark Madagascar's 42nd anniversary of independence. Correspondent Anne Leclerc has this report from Madagascar's capital. The best news for Madagascar in this national day is a letter from President George Bush to President Marc Ravalumana, claiming that now the United States would work with the Madagascar government. This decision also means that the Madagascar funds kept in the American Federal Reserve will be unblocked very soon. This good news has been darkened by the attitude of France, which didn't send any representative to the ceremony. The French government justified this absence by a will to follow the OAU position not to recognize any president in Madagascar. Other countries, as Germany, Great Britain, Japan, and even the European Union, were represented this morning. Marc Ravelman affirmed that he was optimistic France would follow soon. And care for RFI and Antananarivo. Well, analyst Richard Cornwell is at the Institute of Strategic Studies in Pretoria. He told RFI that the U.S. recognition of the Ravalmanan government is a big plus for the country's economy. I think that it would probably pave the way for the IMF and the World Bank to look more favourably on, on the island, uh, with a view to getting it back on its feet. It has shown remarkable economic growth since 1999, uh, largely as a result of the American legislation, um, which allowed the import of garments and fabrics from Madagascar. Uh, this has seen Madagascar's exports to the United States increase about fourfold in the space of three years, uh, a very welcome upturn for one of the poorest countries in the world. Unfortunately, the political mayhem since the December elections of last year uh, has been costing them something in, in the region of 15 million U.S. dollars a day, uh, money that they could ill afford. It's now a matter of time before they have to get their act together uh, get the economy back on its feet, get people back to work, and start the export orders rolling again. That was Richard Cornwall at the Institute of Strategic Studies in Pretoria. The leaders of the world's richest nations meet today in Canada to discuss their relations with the world's poorest countries. The Canadian government has mobilised thousands of security forces to ward off anti-globalisation protesters at the G8 summit. In focus at the meeting in the Rocky Mountains is the NEPAD initiative, the new economic partnership for Africa's development. Britain says it will increase annual aid to Africa to £1 billion within four years. That's almost twice current levels. NEPAD calls for massive investment in Africa and for greater dedication to good governance by the continent's leaders. Baki Kumalo is South Africa's presidential spokesman. He's confident he'll be leaving Canada satisfied. No doubt about that. I think that the very fact that the G8 leaders have decided that they're going to spend the whole day uh, tomorrow uh, here in Canada discussing Africa and discussing the assistance to African continent, I think on its own is a victory and on its own is, is a symbol of, 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 of very great significance to the people of Africa and that the whole world is uniting behind us in attempts to changing our own lives. And therefore we have no doubt whatsoever that we'll emerge out of this meeting with some progress uh, having been made. That was Becky Kumalo, the South African presidential spokesman. 
The United Nations and a famine warning network is blaming Zimbabwe's policies for hindering the import of grain. The country desperately needs to stave off a famine. The comments come in a humanitarian situation report released today. The UN's World Food Programme says about 6 million people will need food relief to survive until the 2003 harvest. Zimbabwe is projected to have a shortfall of nearly 2 million tonnes of cereal. Harare-based economist Tony Hawkins explains what government policies the report has referred to. I think it's alluding to two main things. Firstly, uh, the state monopoly over the import of all grains. And secondly, the price controls that restrict uh, the profitability of the private sector were, assuming it were allowed, to um, provide or to supply grains. Um, I think there's another problem too, which has not been much touched upon, and that is the distribution network, which is struggling to cope. Um, so even if the, 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 the food is available at the border, getting it actually to the people who need it is, is being constrained by the, the um, transport network. And that was economist from Harare, Zimbabwe, Tony Hawkins. RFI, the world's radio. Well, let's now take a look at the international headlines here on Radio France International. The U.S. dollar has fallen against the euro and stock markets have tumbled worldwide in the wake of what's being dubbed the WorldCom disaster. The giant U.S. firm WorldCom disclosed today that its officials had misstated accounting figures by up to $3.8 billion. The affair could eclipse the scandal over the energy giant Enron. It also deepens the collapse of auditors Arthur Anderson, already in the spotlight for criminal wrongdoing. Markets fell chiefly in Western Europe and in the US. But at the Salomon Smith Barney Company in London, credit analyst Mika Torin says the effect on the markets is not expected to last too long. This is typical to the very late stages of a bear market where investors which have lost a lot of money, and now they are, they are saying, I'm fed up, they are, they are leaving the market. But I don't think we are seeing any major crash or anything like that in the future. The prices are already down, so I think it's going to take months for those to recover. There, there's still room for them to go down, but it's very much going to depend on the market sentiment. That was Mika Torin from the company Salomon Smith Barney in London. WorldCom is the second biggest communications firm in the U.S. Last year it said its reported profit was $1.4 billion. Russia's lower house of parliament has made legal the sale of farmland for the first time since the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917. The Communist Party and other left-wing groups opposed the bill, dubbing it a betrayal of Russia. Correspondent Yevgenia Borisova has this report from Moscow. We have about 406 million hectares of agricultural land, including uh, more than 200 million hectares of farmland. And the battles are basically over the farmland. And uh, so in the final reading was approved the bill which now allows sales of such land to everyone except foreigners and people with no citizenship. These people will be able only to lease land, and uh, they will not be able even to lease land in the border areas. That was correspondent Yevgenia Borisova in Moscow. The bill must still be voted in by the Federation Council's upper house, where approval is seen as automatic and then signed by the president. Myanmar's military rulers today burnt drugs they claim were worth more than a billion dollars. This to mark the UN International Day Against Drug Abuse and Illicit Trafficking. Thousands of kilograms of opium, marijuana and amphetamines went up in flames. Myanmar is the world's largest opium producer. Ingvar Danling from the UN Drugs Control Program in Bangkok says Myanmar is the main source of illicit drugs in the Mekong Delta region. Myanmar is the main source of uh, methamphetamine uh, and uh, it's also the main source of uh, heroin, which is something which also the Myanmar government agrees upon, which they did not uh, agree upon uh, some years back. So I believe that uh, the attitude of Myanmar today is more realistic and uh, objective. 
And that was Ingvar Banling, a law enforcement officer for the UN DCP in Bangkok. And uh, lots of seized drugs were also burnt in Bangkok and Thailand today. And in China, media reports say that at least 50 people have been executed for drug trafficking this week. And a Cambodian registered cargo ship has arrived in France, believed to be carrying two tons of cocaine. The Palestinian Authority will hold presidential and legislative elections between the 10th and the 20th of January. The chief Palestinian negotiator, Saeed Arakat, who made the announcements, said it's now too early to say if current President Yasser Arafat will stand. The U.S. President George W. Bush has called on the Palestinians to select a new leadership. And another news report say that Israeli troops have shot dead a six-year-old Palestinian boy after opening fire on a crowd throwing stones in Janine. And in some other world news headlines, a Moroccan judge probing the case of three Saudis arrested on suspicion of links to the Islamic extremist group Al-Qaeda has postponed a hearing because of torture allegations. Syria's state security court has sentenced prominent communist opposition figure Riyad Turk to two and a half years in prison for trying to change the constitution by illegal means. This in a verdict decried by the defence as severe. Judges have ordered a full medical examination of Slobodan Milosevic after the prosecution cast doubt over the seriousness of the former Yugoslav president's illness which has led to a two-week adjournment of his war crimes trial at The Hague. And also today, the OPEC oil cartel has appointed the Venezuelan energy minister, Alvaro Silva Calderon, as its new secretary general. Those are the main world news headlines here on Radio France International. It's now 12 minutes past the hour. Well, of course, it's football dominating the sports news headlines, the latest from the Football World Cup. Brazil qualifying for the final, beating Turkey 1-0 in the tournament's most thrilling game in Saitama in Japan. Comeback kid Ronaldo scored his sixth goal for the Brazilians, stretching his lead as the top gun of the tournament. This, of course, before the big confrontation with three times champions Germany and Yokohama in Japan on Sunday. Meanwhile, Goose Hiddink's South Korea will on Saturday seek consolation in the third-place playoff against Turkey at home in Daegu, a prize sweet enough to please the fantastic army of Red Devil supporters who have given the 2002 tournament much of its colour and emotion off the pitch. Whatever happens against Turkey on Saturday, the Koreans will go down in history as the first Asian nation to reach the World Cup semi-finals after scalping European footballing powers Portugal, Italy and Spain along the way. Meanwhile, Senegal's government apologised today for the actions of its World Cup team during a goodwill trip to Taiwan, however denied reports the squad members had hired prostitutes during the visit. Press reports in Taipei created a frenzy over claims the team secured sexual services from 37 call girls during their promotional visit in the Taipei capital. Opposition politicians in Dakar have called for an investigation into the allegations. And in South Korea, An Jung Hwan, the World Cup hero who scored the winning goal against Italy, has ruled out returning to his Italian club Perugia. This despite claims by the Calcio team that it had patched up a bitter row with him. The pin-up boy of Korean soccer, as he's described, has other plans now with top European clubs Chelsea, West Ham, Atletico Madrid, Hamburg and Glasgow Rangers lining up for a fight to sign him up. And those are the sports news headlines. And later in the programme, we'll be talking to RFI's World Cup correspondent Sophie Nicholson, reporting from Saitama in Japan. But let's now return to the African continent and take a closer look at some of our top stories there this hour. And very much affecting the continent, the leaders of the world's richest nations have met today in Canada to discuss their relations with the world's poorest countries. In focus is the NEPAD initiative, the new economic partnership for Africa's development. NEPAD calls for massive investment in Africa and for greater dedication to good governance by the continent's leaders. Becky Kumalo is South Africa's presidential spokesman. 
RFI Zoe Eisenstein asked him about his hopes for the summit. The new partnership for Africa's development has been in discussions now with African leaders for over three, four years. And uh, in our interactions with leaders of the G8 before the current uh, summit here in, in Gananaskis, we you know, expect that there will be uh, a program that will emerge called the Africa Action Plan, the G8 Africa Action Plan, which will really spell out the kind of uh, involvement of the G8 countries in attempts to revitalize the African continent. And we surely have got no doubt that uh, that plan will go some way in addressing some of our problems uh, and that we hope uh, we'll be able to work in partnership with the developed north. Do you think really the, the, the G8 and uh, NEPAD are going to achieve anything significant or concrete for poor Africans? Do you think this is not just another talk shop? No, not at all. We don't think so. You see, far from it. I think that people must really realize that people who must change their own destiny, who must touch their own destiny, rather, and change their own life and improve it are Africans themselves. What we really need, we need massive um, you know, peace in Africa. We need stability in the African continent. We need respect for human rights, democracy, the rule of law, regular elections, and so on. And in exchange for that, you need to have a situation in which the economies of Africa can grow. Because what you then need to have is that Africans themselves must invest in their own economy. But I mean, South Africa is doing the same with Mozambique. And therefore, I think it's really a myth and I think it's wrong to well, think that the G8 will help us. We, we must help ourselves. The G8 can merely support us. All those things that you just mentioned, good governance and, and uh, an end to wars and that kind of thing, are those really, would you say then, that Africa is at the moment in a situation that... Uh, that it needs to be in to come and ask for help from the G8? Well, I don't think that we can wait. Uh, we must work in partnership with the G8. I think one of the key things that we expect to emerge from the meeting today is the issue of capacity building in the African continent, the need to support conflict resolution, conflict management, you know, in the African continent by, by countries of the G8. Uh, because we, we realize and we recognize that, in fact, that is a, is a vital step. And therefore, there are so many things that we can do ourselves that we can actually, that we are doing at the moment. And, and that's what we expect to happen. Are you aware of the parallel uh, alternative summit taking place in Mali where uh, participants are sceptical about NEPAD uh, and the G8 meeting uh, for, for its potential in helping poor people in Africa? Well, I know. I mean, there are a number of people in, in Africa who have taken ideological positions who are accusing uh, NEPAD of being a neoliberal document, pursuing a, ne- a neoliberal agenda. I mean, those are ideological positions. People do not need ideology. People need food. People need shelter. People need housing. People need to get out of poverty. And we don't think that ideological positions like the ones that people are taking will help us. And talking to us from the G8 summit, that was South Africa's presidential spokesman, Becky Kumalo. The United Nations and a famine warning network is blaming Zimbabwe's policies for hindering the import of grain. The country desperately needs to stave off a famine. RFI Zoe Eisenstein asked Harare-based economist Tony Hawkins why the government would implement policies that harm the population. I think the the main reason for that is the government's belief that it would be ripped off by the private sector and it wants also to have some control over where the food is coming from and where it's going to. Specifically, it has been accused by opposition politicians of diverting food supplies to its own supporters and not to supporters of opposition political parties. Does government have any real reason to believe that the private sector would rip it off? I don't think necessarily no, but I do think that there is a concern that the private sector's prices would be a lot higher, um, not necessarily from a rip-off viewpoint, but simply because um, they, they would need to be um, earning a profit. Do, do you think it's likely at all that government uh, changes its policy in light of this report? And what can it do I- in terms of saving face? I think that, I mean, I don't think it's terribly worried about saving face at this stage, but I do think that um, the likely uh, result of such po- uh, reports would be for the, the government to uh, relax its policies and allow private sector imports. I think that's the, about the only thing it could do. And is it likely to do that? I think it, it probably will do that because the situation is becoming more and more severe almost by the week, more and more dangerous. Um, and it's, it's, um, we, we, the most recent thing we've had is a cutback of uh, 50% in supplies of, of, of grain to the millers, so that means there'll be very little bread around and so on. So I think it, it, it reali- the government realizes the need for, for, for um, radical action. I would certainly believe we'll see some 
some relaxation, not necessarily uh, a publicly admitted change, but I think in, in terms of the administration of that policy, we will see some relaxation. If the government is hindering the process of food uh, getting to the people, what kind of effect is that having on the country? It's extremely difficult to tell. Um, there, there is very little uh, um, public unrest, which you might have expected in this sort of situation. Um, but the situation is bound to get worse, and therefore, um, as that happens, one must to see some deterioration in terms of public order and so on. It would not be at all surprising to see that. And that was economist Tony Hawkins on the line from Harare, Zimbabwe, talking to RFI Zoe Eisenstein. I'm Zoe Eisenstein, and this is Today in France. In a message to the people of Madagascar on the country's Independence Day Wednesday, French President Jacques Chirac called for a quick solution to the political tug of war taking place there. Chirac said he was convinced that only a political solution based on constructive dialogue among all parties can lead Madagascar back to the path of unity, peace and development. In Madagascar's capital, Antananarive, an official ceremony took place to mark the country's 42 years of independence. Ambassadors from the United States, Britain, Germany, Japan, as well as top officials from the EU, the World Bank and the IMF were there. But the French envoy was absent. Claude Vautier is a journalist and an expert in Franco-African relations. The position of uh, France is very clear in that case as in other cases. France follows the uh, line of the Organization of African Unity. And uh, last weekend, in a meeting devoted to the situation in Madagascar, the Organization of African Unity decided that uh, it was recognizing neither of the two uh, contenders, uh, neither Ravalo Banana nor Ratsikaka as president of Madagascar. But doesn't and it seem surprising that France would take a different line uh, to other uh, big donors and other countries around the world. It might be not a very good move, but this in foreign policy, there are always principles which you try to observe as much as possible. And uh, in that case, uh, the situation is a bit complicated and France prefers not to interfere directly and to act with the tacit approval of the Organization of African Unity, and this is the reason. It must be noted, though, that President Chirac refused to receive Didier Chirac while he was in Paris, while he was in France. What does France get out of adopting this kind of position? I, I think France is not going to, to get anything except maybe uh, the fact that she has... Uh, comforted the position of the Organization of African Unity, which will have no doubt to settle other conflicts in the future. Mark Ravalomanan was sworn in as Madagascar's president last month after disputed elections in December, but his inauguration wasn't internationally recognized. Since then, the country's long-standing leader, Didier Ratsirak, has refused to accept his defeat and scores of people have been killed in the dispute between the two men. But on Wednesday, France, as Madagascar was celebrating its independence from France, the United States announced it was formally recognizing President Marc Ravalomanan as the country's legitimate leader. But is France likely to follow suit? I put that question to Claude Vautier. Probably uh, France will wait until the Organization of African Unity takes a position on the subject and maybe uh, the military victory of Ravalo Banana. But of course it would be uh, better probably for French diplomacy not to wait until that time. And couldn't it also become embarrassing for France to still not recognize Ravalo Banana as the country's president when other countries, other major countries around the world do recognize him? Yes, but uh, I mean, maybe they, you know how the African heads of state are. They don't like people who uh, demote former presidents. And uh, there is a sort of syndicate of African heads of state, and there is a solidarity between them. And maybe there are many African heads of state who are pro-Ansiraka. But is France and should France be part of this syndicate? 
Well, it's just a matter of uh, realism. I mean, you have to take into consideration the opinions of the other African head of state and the opinion of the Organization of African Unity if you want to have a, a coherent uh, a foreign policy in Africa. But uh, in the case, it seems that Ravalo Manana is going to win, and uh, it will be a setback for the French uh, diplomacy if he does, and if France does not uh, alter its position. That was journalist and expert in Franco-African relations Claude Vautier here in Paris. And that ends this edition of Today in France. From me, Zoe Eisenstein, it's goodbye and take care. Let's go back to the Football World Cup. Brazil qualifying for the final after beating Turkey 1-0 in Saitama in Japan. Comeback kid Ronaldo shot the four-time winners home, scoring his sixth goal for the Brazilians and stretching his lead as the top gun of the tournament. Of course, they now play Germany and Yokohama in Japan on Sunday in the final. RFI's World Cup correspondent Sophie Nicholson sent this report from Saitama. Brazil, on ever-increasing form, has made it through their World Cup semi-final to a place in the final opposite Germany. Ronaldo scored the match's only goal just after half-time in a game where many opportunities were missed on both sides. Saitama's 63,000-seater stadium was almost full, many with Brazil supporters in yellow shirts. Many of the thousands of Brazilians resident in Japan helped warm up the atmosphere on a chilly night. Many Turkish players were not in the mood to speak to the press after the match, although they fought a close game and just lacked the finishing to pull through. Ilan Manziz, who scored in Turkey's quarter final against Senegal, said he was pleased with his team's performance. Yeah, we played very well. We had some chances, but Brazil has had uh, more chances than us. And after the second half, they scored the leading goal, but at the second half, we had the opportunity to for the equality but we weren't able to score so Brazil is qualified for the final. I wish them good luck. Ilan Manzis of Turkey. Brazil's Ronaldinho could only cheer on his team from the sidelines after being sent off in the team's last match against England. But the South American side had plenty of other players on the attack. Rivaldo played a great game, helping many to forget his play acting during Turkey's first World Cup match against Brazil, which caused Hakan and Sal to be sent off. Juninho Paulista had been hoping to replace Ronaldinho, but ended up staying on the bench. Well, we, we, we knew that it would be a hard match for Brazil, so I think Brazil was, uh, was prepared. And then and did a, a good defender and then had a lot, a lot of opportunities to score. Uh, scored just one, but was a, was a, a great goal. And then... We are in the final. And how important is this? I mean, obviously it's an important match, but the fact that it's Germany, I mean, it's quite a historic match. Brazil never played Germany either in, in the World Cup. Exactly. And then uh, two uh, great uh, national teams. So it will be a, a great match, and then I hope that Brazil get uh, the title. What do Brazil need to do to beat Germany? Need to do? I think he's playing the same that we are playing, so... Uh, German had a good team and have to mark very well, but uh, Brazil have to play the same that they're playing. Juninho Paulista of Brazil. The World Cup final will take place in Yokohama, Japan on Sunday, June the 30th. Although there have been many surprises in the competition so far, the final match is a head-to-head -head between two very experienced teams who've never met at the World Cup. Brazil are hoping to grab a fifth victory, especially after losing out in France in 1998. Germany hosts of the next World Cup in 2006 are wishing for their fourth victory. It's not quite over for Turkey. They'll play out a match for third place on Saturday against South Korea. We'll be counting on some more enthusiastic home support. Sophie Nicholson, RFI, Saitama, Japan. And it's almost time to say goodbye today here on Radio France International. But before that, I'm very sad but also happy to say that it's my last day today here at Radio France International after three and a half years of working in the English service. I'd like to say to you, the listener, that it's been a pleasure and a privilege presenting the news for you. I'm moving on to greener pastures, back to my home country, New Zealand, for a while and then perhaps back to the south of France to live. Of course, I leave you in good hands here at Radio France International, but I will miss our regular rendezvous here on the radio. Just enough time to say one last time from me, Seamus Kearney. Until the next time, it's goodbye and take care. Oh, my God.